Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Coulton. And starring two of radio's foremost personalities, Lyle Sudo and Robert Dunley, in Behind the Locked Door. This is a mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as I bring you the strange and chilling story so many of you have asked to hear again. I call it Behind the Locked Door. Our story begins in the beautiful mountain region of Lake Mead, Arizona. A convertible car is speeding along a deserted road which winds through the mountains. The car slows down and turns into a dirt road. A few minutes later, it comes to a stop before a small mountain lodge. Kathy Evans, an attractive girl in her early 20s, gets out of the car, runs up the steps of the lodge to the front door. She knocks impatiently, looking about anxiously. Yes? Martin. Kathy. I thought I'd find you here. Aren't you going to ask me? Go away, Kathy. Martin, what's wrong? Go away. Go away. Not until I find out what this is all about. Well, let me in. Are you alone? Hello? Yes. Darling, look at yourself. You haven't shaved in days. Martin, those deep gashes on your nick and face. How did you get them? It doesn't matter. Darling, you must have lost a great deal of blood. And your fever. Yes, I know. Is it true about Professor Stevens? Yes. Why did you leave town so suddenly last night? The authorities are looking for you. Do they know I'm here? No. How could they? <laughs> it was intuition that brought me here. They must have found me. Martin, mm. nothing makes sense. Mm. You returned from an expedition last night alone, unexpected. You stay in town one hour and then vanish. Not even phoning it's, me. It's best that way. Believe me, Kathy. You've got to tell me everything that's happened. I can't, Kathy. I can't. I'm your fiancé. I've got a right Kathy, to know. Kathy, go away, please. I won't go away until you tell me what's happened. <laughs> if I do, then will you go? Yes. <laughs> I... I don't know where to begin. I suppose if you can say it had a beginning. It, it was that day a little over two weeks ago in Professor Stevens' office. Come in, Martin. Come in. Have a seat. Thank you, Professor. Martin, how would you like to go exploring with me for, say, ten days and two weeks at the outside? Exploring where? The Vermilion Cliffs along the Colorado River. I found some wonderful Aztec pieces there last summer. One large cave I stumbled on proved to be a veritable treasure trove. Yes, yes, I've seen those Aztec pieces in the University Museum. Now, the Vermilion Cliffs still remain largely unexplored. I'm sure that we could turn up many more objects of interest. <laughs> it certainly sounds intriguing. The only reason I hesitate, Professor, is because of Kathy. Oh, I'm sure she'd give you a two-week leave of absence. <laughs> Yes, I suppose so. How many of us would go? Well, it would just be you, myself, and an Indian guide. And three burrows. I find that the fewer there are on an expedition, the better. Mm -hmm. When would we leave? Well, what about the day after tomorrow? All right, Professor, I'm with you. So these are the Vermilion Cliffs, Professor. Yes. An awe-inspiring sight, aren't they? Yeah, they're as breathtaking as the Grand Canyon itself. 
I have no idea they towered so high. Yes, they make you realize just how insignificant man really is. Yeah. Now, this region is so desolate, Martin, that it's all but unexplored. That's why I'm drawn to it time and time again. Yes, I can understand that. It represents the challenge of the unknown. <laughs> Careful, Martin, you'll get the exploring bug. Oh, I've already been bitten, Professor. Well, if you're going to be an explorer and an archaeologist, I'll have to start teaching you the fundamentals of the profession. Stan, this seems like a good spot. We'll camp here for the night. Phew. Well, it certainly is hot, Professor. Exploring isn't as easy as I thought. Yeah. All right, Professor, what is it? For 20 minutes now, you've been sitting on that rock staring at that cliff. Yeah. Note the boulders strewn over the face of that cliff. What about them? Well, that's a very peculiar landslide. If you carefully study the formation of it... What's peculiar about it? Many of the rocks look as though they'd been placed there by human hands. <laughs> But why and by whom? Well, one of the ancient Aztec forms of punishment was to seal a person in a cave by means of a landslide or just piling heavy rocks in front of the mouth of the cave. Hmm. That landslide, there must be hundreds of tons of rock there. Yeah. Well, fortunately, we're prepared for it. Is that why you brought the dynamite along? Yes. <laughs> Probably all we'll find will be a skeleton. In that case, it'll have been a waste of dynamite. However, we'll chance it. Oh, Sam. What do you want? Get the case of dynamite, Sam. I'm going to blast that landslide. Professor. Better leave it. Same way it be. Why? Evil spirit sleep in cave. Better not wake him up. <laughs> you really believe that, Martin? I wouldn't laugh. Sam may be uneducated. But he senses things that you and I can't even begin to comprehend. Now, wait a minute. You mean you believe what he said about evil being asleep in that cave? I wouldn't say that I believe it. But nevertheless, I respect Sam's opinion. But Sam, I still want to blast that landslide. Hey, get dynamite. Keep your head down, Martin. When I set that dynamite off, there are going to be a great many rocks flying around. Don't worry, Professor. I've got cover. Sam, you ready? Yes, Professor. All right. Here goes. Keep your head down. All right. It's safe now. Professor, I think you did it. I can see a small opening. It looks like a mouth of a cave. Yes, it is. Sam, let me have one of the flashlights. Martin, you take the other. Uh -huh. I'll lead the way in. Just as you say, Professor. The air doesn't seem too bad in here. Yes, it's all right. Yeah, it... What's that noise? Just... Rats scurrying around. Oh. Certainly a huge cavern. Mm. Look at that ceiling. Must be 200 feet high. Oh, look at the bats up there. Yes, huge ones. I have a feeling that this cavern and others extend for miles underground. Yeah, I... Professor, look. Skeleton. Yes. There's, there's, there's another one over there. Yes. Let's see what else there is. Wagon train. What? Good Lord. Sam's right. It's a wagon train. A wagon train? Sam. Yeah. There are at least 30 or 40 wagons in this cavern. Look. Skeletons of horses. Yeah. Here's a skeleton with an arrow beside it. Let me see it. Oh. Yeah. to be a Navajo arrow. What do you think, Sam? Navajo. <laughs> Professor, this... This wagon train, what's it all mean? Well, many years ago, this wagon train was attacked by Indians. Wagon train retreated into this cavern, hoping to save themselves that way. 
Then the Indians caused the landslide, sealing them in. Yeah. Poor devils. <laughs> Notice that old gun lying there. Yeah. The flintlock. Seems to suggest that this wagon train must be at least a hundred years old. Yeah, probably headed for the California gold rush of 1848. Yeah. Well, we'll come back tomorrow and search this wagon train thoroughly. I'm sure we'll find many things of great interest. The next morning, after an early breakfast, Sam and I followed Professor Stevens back into the cabin. We spent the morning investigating the trunks and boxes we found on the wagons. And among the moldy clothing and 101 household articles, we found faded letters and newspapers which showed the wagon train had crossed the Mississippi in the summer of 1849, headed west for California and gold. We finished rummaging among the effects of the wagons, and the professor suggested we explore the cavern. We followed him from one cavern to another, each varying in size. Now and then, the professor would stop to mark our trail, for the caverns were honeycombed with countless passageways. How far do you think we've come, professor? I should say we're about a mile from the wagon train. Huh? We'll go back a few more minutes. We go back now. This place is evil. Now, Sam, if there are ghosts here, they're only the ghosts of the people in the wagon train. They wouldn't harm us. I tell you, evil. Feel it. All around. We we'll go back. We'll go just a little further. Then turn back. Yeah, Professor, wait a minute. What is it, Martin? You know, I think I hear running water. Yes, you're right. Come along. We seem to be getting closer. Yeah, yeah. Evil all around us. Can't be much further. Well, there it is. Yeah. It's a small river. <laughs> Look how swiftly it's flowing. Yeah. It probably flows for miles underground and it empties into the Colorado River. Say, hey, Professor, here along the bank, there's a tremendous pile of fish bones. Yes, yeah, so there is. Look. Well, there are even more on the other side of the river. Hmm. What do these huge piles of fish bones mean? It's very strange. Well, how do you account for it? I'm afraid that at the moment I can't. Sam, you any ideas about it? He is a little around us. I feel him strong. Professor, he's trembling. Sam, there's nothing to be afraid of. Look, I'll shine my flashlight around, please. We've been watched. Watch. What are you talking about? One stay here. I go. Sam, come back. You haven't even got a flashlight. Sam! Come on, Mark. We've got to catch him. Sam! Wait for us. I can still hear his footsteps. We've got to catch him. And who himself a serious injury running in the dark like that? Sam! Wait for us. Ah! Wait. Professor, it's Sam screaming. This way. A fool's probably broken his leg. Oh, that sounds more like a fight. I who could he possibly be fighting with? He stopped. Sam, where are you? Keep shining the flashlight around. Oh, can't be much further. Sam! There he is. Yes. 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 Yes, just, just sitting against that boulder. His head down. Sam. Give me a hand with him. Good Lord. His face. Nick. Yes. Who could, who could have done this to him? I, I don't know, but there must be an explanation. There has to be. But I have a theory. But it... So oh, incredible. I can't bring myself to voice it. Tell me. What do you think I'm in? Tell me. What if the people of the wagon train, or rather the descendants, are alive here in these huge caverns? Oh, that's impossible. Why? Picture what happened the day the 150 people or so were sealed into this mountain by the Indians. What would have been the first thing they'd have done? Tried to dig their way out. Exactly. 
They start digging and find there are a hundred ton boulders blocking the entrance, and they have no dynamite. They're forced to give up. Yes. They spend days looking for another way out. Fail to find one. The day comes when all their food is gone. Starvation sets in. All right, all right. Then that would mean they would all die. Not necessarily. The strongest of them stumble along in the darkness and find the underground river. They catch an abundance of fish and are able to survive. The huge fishbone piles along the river. Right. The river was an everlasting supply of food. They continue to live by the river in the dark. Some um, probably went insane, died. Others adjusted themselves to their new environment. Professor, you, you think those handful of survivors had descendants who are alive today inside this mountain? Yes, Martin. And it was one of them who clawed Sam to death. What can those descendants be like? Being born and, and, and living in darkness? I can only guess. I should imagine they'd be blind or near to it. But their other senses would be remarkably developed. Their physical appearance. I don't know. <laughs> it's not like a nightmare. A nightmare you can't awaken from. What, what's to prevent them from attacking us? And our flashlights, for one thing. I'm sure light frightens them, just as fire frightens animals. Fortunately, I have a revolver. Well, we better move on. Wait a minute. What about Sam? And nothing we can do for him now. Come along, Martin. We must find the trail I marked so that we can get out of here. Seems we've been searching days for the markings you left. Yes. Actually, it's been ten hours. That's the point. The river. Yes. Come along. Once we reach the river, we'll be able to pick up the trail I'm on. We're getting closer. Yes. There it is. Here we are. Look, Martin, there's my marking on the passageway. We found the trail. Yes. Martin, 2 a.m. We'd better rest for a few hours. We're both too exhausted to go on right now. If one of us stand guard, and the other sleeps. All right. Oh, I'll set up the first hour. Thank you, Martin. Keep the flashlight on. Don't worry. I will. In a matter of minutes, the professor fell asleep. And I sat on guard, flashing my light slowly around the huge cabin. I looked at my watch in a second, seemed like minutes and a minute like hours. My eyes grew heavy and I finally dozed off. Suddenly I awakened in the darkness to hear the professor screaming. I stumbled in the darkness, but I couldn't find it. Then suddenly they were shot. By the flashes of the gun, I could see the professor struggling with a huge, dark figure. And suddenly all was quiet. Except for the professor's moon. As I crawled toward him, in the darkness, my hand struck the flashlight. I turned it on, and there was the professor. Uh, Martin, I think... I'm wounded. You're, you're bleeding badly. Let me dance your wounds. Too late. Leave at once. At once. But what about you? Professor? Professor! I felt his heart. But there was no beat. I staggered to my feet. Shined my flashlight around until I found the professor's marking. I stumbled wearily along the marked passageway, trying not to remember my last glimpse of the professor's face. I hadn't gone more than a hundred yards when suddenly my flashlight flickered and went out. As I stood alone in the darkness, that scampering past I fought to keep from screaming. The darkness seemed to become heavier and more oppressive with each passing moment, and I had the feeling something was silently approaching. 
I backed up against the passage wall, waited, my eyes straining in the darkness, and then suddenly I was leaped upon by a wild fury. I threw my arms up and raised my arms, right my face and neck. Again and again, the guard was out of the side, and I could feel the blood streaming down my face and neck. And then suddenly the deathly clawing ceased as my attacker turned to ward off something in the dark. As I sank to my knees, I was dimly aware of a fierce fight taking place in the men's consciousness. <laughs> Later. How much later, I have no way of knowing. I became aware of a heavy, calloused hand washing my face and neck with water. I winced in pain as the water flowed into the deep cuts, and then suddenly I remembered all. And remembering all, became aware of the calloused hand washing my face in the presence of someone beside me in the darkness. Who are you? For a moment, the hand hesitated, then resumed washing the neck. Well, can't you speak? Say something! Uh, 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 The noise came from uh, its throat that was more than that of an animal than a human being. If I could only see you. Do you have a name? It spoke. It seemed to repeat the word name, though I couldn't be sure. And faint from the loss of blood, I closed my eyes and fell asleep. When I awoke, my face and neck felt stiff and painful. It seemed to sense I was awake for as I opened my eyes and stared into the darkness that came to my side. Can't, can't you understand anything at all? Don't my words make any sense to you? Why did you save my life? My hand brushed against its hand. And I could feel it sharp, claw-like fingers on it. I reached out in the darkness as I touched its face. It bit my hand. I tried to get to my feet, but it placed a strong hand on my shoulder and held me down. At that moment, I realized that not only was it my savior, but my jailer as well. I lost all track of time. Now and then, it would leave me. And I would cautiously get to my feet to steal off. But no sooner had I taken more than a few steps than it would be there at my side, forcing me to return to the bank of the river. I spent my every waking moment trying to think of a way to escape. And then, when my despair was greatest, an idea came to me. The professor had said that the underground river I lay beside emptied into the Colorado River. Though the odds were a hundred to one against my surviving, I knew it was the only possible way of escape. Slowly, I crawled a few remaining feet to the edge of the river and leaning over, started to wash my face. I could sense that it was watching me. I leaned forward a few inches more and fell into the river. As I came up for air in the swift flowing water, I heard a splash beside me. A moment later, I felt its arms around me. The current swept us along with breathtaking speed, and as we clung to each other, I discovered that it couldn't swim. For what seemed hours, the river swept us along in the darkness, and I felt myself losing consciousness as I attempted to keep the two of us above water. (laughs) When, When I regained consciousness, Kathy, we were both lying on a sandbar in the Colorado River, and the sun was beating down on us. <laughs> Carling, you're delirious from your wounds. You need a doctor. <laughs> I wish. I wish it were as simple as all that. You're feverish. You need care. Don't go away, Kathy. Go away. How can I? Leaving you alone like that? Don't you understand? I'm not alone. She's here. She's here? Yes. 
<laughs> Didn't I tell you? Turned out to be a she. You're out of your mind. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, I first saw her that first time. Lying unconscious on that sandbar, my first instinct was to leave her there. But how could I? She had saved my life in the cavern and then jumped into the river when she thought I was drowning, even though she couldn't swim herself. Martin, I want you to get a grip on yourself. Just as I was dependent on her in the dark, she's dependent on me in the light. She's blind. She can't speak yet. She... <laughs> Stop talking like that. <laughs> you can't believe it's true, can you, Kathy? Neither could I at first. What are you staring at? Huh? Is there anyone in that bedroom? <laughs> well, I'll soon find out. Why is the door locked? She's in there. Martin, you are sick. You don't know what you're saying. <laughs> I'll prove to you there's no one in that room. It's just your imagination. Give me the key to the door. Kathy, Kathy, go Give away. Give it to me. Thank you. Perhaps when you see the room is empty, you'll be willing to return to town for medical treatment. There. I told you. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our trip? What's that, madam? You want a description of what Kathy saw when she opened that bedroom door? Well, you might ask Kathy. The only trouble is the poor girl gets hysterical when you question her about the occupant of that bedroom. I suggest you write a letter to the Museum of Horrors for a full description. They consider the woman of the mountain as their star exhibit. Because when she... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler. You may now enjoy other exciting adventures of The Mysterious Traveler in the current issue of The Mysterious Traveler magazine. In our cast, Lyle Sudrow, Anne Shepard, and Robert Donnelly with Maurice Topper in the title role. Phil Tonkin speaking. This program came to you from New York. Mutual's ace commentator Cecil Brown, currently on a three-month fact-finding tour of the world, heads for the Orient on the last lap of his history-making trip. In these last weeks, Mr. Brown will bring you on the -the on-the-scene reports from such tinderbox areas as India, Hong Kong, Hawaii, Japan, and Honolulu. You won't want to miss any of the eyewitness accounts by this able commentator of the latest happenings in these headline-making spots of the world. Be sure to listen to the news reports of Cecil Brown over most of these stations. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mm-hmm.